Um, for the community of the saints on the inside of your, your handout, I'll let you take a look at that later this week, but it's uh, St. Catherine of Alexandria. She's got a very interesting story, um, not the least of which uh, is apparently Joan of Arc claimed that she was one of the saints that appeared to her. So there's a whole history there that would just... I've noticed that my sermons, Gavin, have been going over the 40-minute mark, and people really want me to keep it to 18 and 35 seconds. So I can't, I can't belabor the saints, okay? We good? Good. Yeah. Okay. So, I recommend that to you, all right? Jeremy said he wanted me to preach 50 minutes. Yeah. Amen. I don't know about All right. Praise the Lord. So if you want to uh, page, the inside of page one there, I want to talk about Intro is something called, uh, I need your help. <laughs> yeah, Charlie's not here. Andy called out. I mean, I had a whole crew that was going to be here in white that I was going to use for a massive illustration. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. <laughs> You've been with me through the garden and for the cross. Well, actually, it's the Lord. No, you, know, you know what I mean. We're standing there together looking at Jesus. Okay, now, I'm going to, I'm going to, Trying to not to get too technical, but I want to illustrate something, and I think this white album is going to help. Put your arm all the way out here. Now, you will notice Alex has frillies. I don't know what the technical term is, but I think frill works, right? No? Okay. Now, when we talk about a sacrament, I want you to think of a sacrament, uh, if there's two parts to it, okay? There's the visible part, the part you can touch. It's tangible, something, something you can grab. But then, because he's got these frills on it, you see how you can kind of see through the inside of it? Mm -hmm. right. See, that's the point of a sacrament, is that you're supposed to see through it to the reality behind it. So if it's the bread, and the, one of the reasons that the priest lifts up the bread is not because there's something special about the molecules in the bread, but to say, look through the bread to the reality behind it. The crucifixion and the resurrection. All right? So, this is still important. A sacrament is what we call a sure, effectual, it's effective, sign. The reality, you can't, you can't, you see, you can't grab it. It's not physical. It's not tangible. But the 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 the, subs, the, the physical part is right. The reality of it, you can't you can't get it. It's a race, right? You can't you can't get it. It's not, it's not there. It's there, excuse me, but it's not there. The sure effectual part of the sacrament is that this is there. So it's sure and effectual because when the word of God through duly authorized ministers according to God's commandment, connect. When the words of Jesus are spoken over the bread and the wine, and the power of the Holy Spirit, the request of the minister comes down, boom. Now it's not just bread and wine. It's consecrated. It's holy. But it's holy and consecrated because it's pointing to something. Can you see me? <laughs> pointing through something else. Okay? What that means is, thanks buddy, what that means is, Whenever you receive communion, no matter how you're feeling, you are receiving Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, that invisible reality is apprehended by faith. So there are many, many Christian groups, especially in the past 150 years, 200 years, who have significant experiences with God disconnected from the sacrament. Are they really meeting with the Lord? Yeah, probably. There's a very important distinction here, okay? Yeah, I don't doubt that they are. But can you be absolutely sure that they are? Well, no. Because did Jesus tie his word and his promise to anything other than the sacraments? Because even hearing the preaching of the word is sacrament. It's the Word of God that comes to us, that changes us. All right? Sure, effectual sign. And I want us to get that when we think about Christ as the King. The Christ is the King. Christ is alive. Because He's alive, He's the King. And the Gospel reading this morning was His crucifixion. 
As much as we sang that awesome hymn, uh, 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 psalm about, you know, the Lord, He smote them on their parts behind. We kind of know what that means. Uh, yeah, we, we, we like that, right? Most of us sometimes. I mean, maybe you like Jesus with the guitar. Sorry, guitarists. Maybe you like Jesus barefoot with guitars just underneath the tree singing a ballad about flowers and lilies. Maybe not. Maybe you like the shouting, triumphant, trumpet blasts, flag waving, dancing across the mountains, Jesus, who takes back his land. You know, you see these different accounts in the Gospels. When we go to seize the Lord, to grab a hold of him, we have to remember that he grabbed a hold of us first, or would never attempt to go after him. When we're talking about the signum and the race, or the visible and the invisible, the sign and the reality. You can experience a spiritual reality, but you can be sure that you're experiencing it when you have the sacrament. And this is very difficult for Christians who have never prayed or studied the Scripture and understood that the kingdom of God is expressed and manifest tangibly. If you don't think that the kingdom of God is tangible, come here. <laughs> you sit on the front here man. I'm on the crucifixion pose for me boom just like this you don't have to follow me with that because you can hear it right Okay. you're part of the crowd Christ is being crucified and over top of his head it says king of the Jews does anything about that look like the fulfillment of the Old Testament based upon what you've probably been taught as a Jew in that day None of it looks like it's the kingdom of God. As a matter of fact, it looks like the absolute, categorical, thunderous defeat of all of God's plans and purposes since Noah. Complete and total failure. Because the kingdom of God is always demonstrated through the cross. But we don't look at it like that. Okay. Hands down. Stand there. Stand it up. <clears throat> Can I borrow this? Sure. <laughs> this was spontaneous. <laughs> Yes. Blood martyrdom. We're early Christians. We're in Rome. No. Let's let's do even better. Because I talk about it. We're in Antioch. And Alex is the bishop. He's Ignatius. And Alex, as Ignatius has been the bishop in, in Antioch since before Jerusalem fell. Personal friend. Probably... Discipled by Paul, Barnabas, Timothy, Titus, and those Peter. Peter's in Antioch and Galatians. We know all that. Early church tradition says that Ignatius was one of the kids that Jesus picked up and blessed. Mm -hmm. Ignatius. Arrested. Paraded through the Roman Empire so that they can mock him on his way to martyrdom. Right there in red. He writes a letter to the church in Rome where they're going to martyr him. And he says, don't get my release. Because if you lobby the government to get me released, you're gonna uh, Christ won't get the glory anymore. It's going to be a testimony that uh, it's going to testify to the fact that Jesus isn't worthy of all of our worship. That's what he says. The early church understood the martyrs to be the continuation of Christ's death. How is Jesus king? Right here. In the book of Revelation. Thanks. Appreciate it. You can sit down. Can I borrow that? In the book of Revelation, God the Father is sitting on the throne and he's got that scroll sealed with seven seals. And John weeps because no one's able to take the scroll or break the seals. No one found in heaven or on earth or under the earth. And he's weeping. And the elders like, what are you crying about? The lion of the tribe of Judah has overcome it. And so Jesus goes up, takes the scroll, and he breaks the seal. And what's the first seal? White horse. Uh, something about bows and arrows, and the absence of arrows, really, but the conqueror. And then he breaks the second seal. What's the second seal? Got that red horse for war. And then that third seal, he breaks that third seal. That third seal is a pale horse. I'm sorry, it's the black horse because of famine. And then the fourth seal is the pale horse, which is death. Meaning what? Fighting amongst the nations. Conquest amongst the nations. War, famine, and death are all signs that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Whoa. 
What did the kingdom of God look like in the Gospels? And it still looks like that. We've got an inverted view of what it looks like to see the kingdom of God released on the earth. We think it is the fulfillment of Jesus as a King David. That he will come back and he will rout his adversaries. I love that song about his adversaries fleeing because his adversaries are hell and death and all the infernal powers of darkness that seek to destroy the soul. And Christ overthrows them categorically. He's drowned them in the sea so that they can never rise again. That's the victory of the church. That's the kingdom of God. So we think about Christ the King. It's never separated from the cross. So point one. The kingdom can be found and seen when we endure in trial with Jesus. A couple snips there from Luke 22, Scripture snippets. He says to the apostles, You are those who have stayed with me in my trials. I want to parallel throughout the course of this message what he says to the apostles at the Last Supper in Luke 22 and with a couple other portions of Scripture that kind of tie it together. Because while he's having dinner with them, he says, you've been with me through my trials. You've been with me. Interesting that when we get to 23 and he's hanging on the cross, it's the thief who discerns who he is. And he says, today you will be with me in paradise. Because the thief says, look at it, the thief. Maybe it's because he's so close to death that now he's given the eyes to see. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Something about this dying man hanging next to Jesus opens his eyes to perceive that the man that's dying next to him is indeed the king and he has authority over hell and death. Acts chapter 14. I think, uh, I think this is going to be my next book series. I'm going, to get a, I'm going to get a circuit. I'm going to get some big conferences with this next one right here. All right? I got study guides prepared. I got really nice pictures of nature and stuff. So you on the cover. Father Fitzwater, right at the bottom. And some sparkles and stuff. Watch now. Strengthening the souls of the disciples. That's good. That's good. Because strengthening is often used by Paul and Luke to refer to prophetic ministry. Doesn't have to, but often. Strengthening the souls of the disciples. Encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many successful experiences by which we're promoted through life, we <laughs> enter the kingdom of God. Uh, no. You got a pencil? I need to erase that. Somebody mark this up. <laughs> many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Mm. Bill? I had a church in Baltimore. And I had this guy as a youth pastor. And he told me. He said, you got to stop getting them feathers out from underneath the, the pulpit and tickling our ears. <laughs> Jason told me that. I said, I'm sorry, man. I don't like to try to find things in the Bible that get us. They just get me. And I think I'm pretty normal. I hope, Larry. Maybe. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> many tribulations. Because, you know, how many times are you there and you're hearing somebody present the gospel and they're preaching and they're sharing something and they say, I mean, I, 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 man, the amount of evangelism I've done with folks and it goes something like this. God loves you. God knew you before he made you. He's got a wonderful plan for your life. All you got to do is give your life to Jesus and you'll have that, he'll, he'll make that plan happen for you. I, I really wish that was in the Bible. Somebody didn't tell Paul. Because what he says right here is it's through many tribulations that we enter the kingdom of God. The moment you make a decision to follow Christ, that the very next, within 48 hours, you're going to get spiritually hit. Mm -hmm. The tribulations begin the moment you decide to follow Jesus. The testings, the temptations, the trials, the things that you didn't see coming from anywhere all of a sudden show up. And if you've been sold a bad bill of goods, that by coming to Jesus all of that goes away, then you were deceived. Thank God you came to Christ anyway. And I wish I could tell you that the trials only get 
less. <laughs> but the more the Lord conforms you into his image, it's not that he's putting you in more, uh, more tribulatory situations. It's that you are becoming more and more like him. And so your soul is more and more afflicted by what you see in the world and in the church around you. And it becomes an increasing temptation for you to not sit, not to go out and commit heinous sin because you want to do it, but because you're responding to the darkness around you. You're still culpable. You're still responsible. Because you what what's happened? The Lord has put you in that crux because now you're seeing, I'm becoming more like the Lord, but you're not looking at him anymore. You're looking back here at this wrong that was done to you, and you go back and you live into this wrong, and you justify all of your bad thinking and decisions because of this event right here, because someone told you that you would get through the kingdom of God without any problem. That's not true. It is through many tribulations that we will enter the kingdom of God. And that's got to be encouragement to us because Jesus told the apostles, and they are they're the, they're the paradigm for us, you have been with me. You have been with me. And what is the promise? I will give you a kingdom. Now, I want you to take a look at for, uh, Colossians 1 here. This, this is one of these passages in the Bible that I spent, I want to say 18 months praying through, trying to figure out what the world it meant. Some year, many years ago, a number of years ago, years ago, because all the commentators I could find that made a comment on it either didn't comment on it, like they just skipped it, or I'm like, well, thanks guys, why did I pay forty dollars for this commentary when I could have got it? If you buy Bible commentaries, right, Arthur, you know that they all typically comment on the same stuff, just their particular perspective. I'm not interested in that. Please give me something that's qualitatively different with substance, right? Right. It's this right here. I rejoice in my sufferings, these are Paul's, my sufferings for your sake, the Colossians, and in my flesh I am filling up what is in Christ's afflictions. What? What does that mean? I thought Jesus paid it all. What is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body? Whoa. Back that truck up. Here's what Paul's saying. If Christ was here right now in Colossians, he would be suffering the way I'm suffering for your redemption. This is recorded. Hey, all you people that talk to me about being called into the ministry, if you could do something else, do it. <laughs> and that's not because I'm disparaging the ministry if you're really called the Lord's not going to let you rest in anything else you're going to have to do it but you've got to understand you don't just decide that you're going to go suffer for the church and that suffering is in proportion to the particular anointing and gift God puts on someone like Paul's suffering is extreme because when you look at the kind of ministry that he has and when you look at you find this is, this is just a good way of discernment. Look at, look at, think of your favorite preachers that you've known throughout your Christian experience, or the one that you like to read about or in history, that kind of thing. Think about that person's life and how much of their life was characterized by a particular problem or problems. All of that is in proportion to what the Lord was calling them to do, what he was releasing through them for the church. It is through many tribulations that we enter the kingdom of God. So if you find those preachers and those teachers who don't experience tribulation, now, everybody experiences it to some extent because we're human, but I'm talking about the kind that comes because of the offense of the cross, then you need to guard what you're hearing from that person because it's very likely that they weren't sent by the Lord. It goes back to Jeremiah 23 reading. Now, why is Paul suffering? Or what's going on? He says, Him, Christ, we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom. Let me tell you what wisdom is. Wisdom isn't that you got a good idea. Wisdom, you can stay there. Wisdom <laughs> is seeing the end from the beginning. Wisdom is seeing the end from the beginning. Wisdom isn't, uh, the Lord says, go do thus and such. That's not a, that's not a word of wisdom. 
Wisdom is, is, it can be a momentary insight into something, but when Paul talks about praying for the spirit of wisdom, what he's saying is you need to grow up in your ability to discern so that you can see the end from the beginning of any given situation, and that way you can decide what is wise and move forward. When you think about most of the big decisions that you've had in your life and you were crippled with indecision, it was usually because you didn't have the wisdom, not because you didn't have the courage. So we need wisdom. And here is Paul saying that his sufferings is what he is, is, is this, this affliction he's experiencing for their sake. And in the midst of this persecution and the affliction, he is now preaching and exhorting all of them, warning them that there is a day of judgment that's coming with all wisdom. You've got to see the end from the beginning. There is no wisdom in the church today because the church leaders aren't saying we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for the things that are done in the body. That's wisdom. It's wisdom that says you're going to make this decision in your life, you're going to move here, you're going to buy this, you're going to do that. Have you considered these four or five things? I remember... Uh, I don't know, 15 years ago, I got tired of prophesying to people. Because they didn't listen. <laughs> like, I, I really hear distinctly the Lord saying, they should do this, or I'm calling them to do that. And the number of folks that would share that with, they just didn't listen. Um, whether it was individuals, or just that kind of thing. You know. And then, um, then, I, then I, and I, and I don't deal with that as much anymore. Go figure. But I, I remember that sort of wrestling. Like, why, 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 why even do you send someone like that? And then pastorally, I, I have the same challenge with wisdom. Because someone will say, what do you think? And I'll say, well, have you considered this, this, and this? I recommend this, this, and this. And typically they do that, that, and that. <laughs> and then when they did that, that, and that, and it blew into a million pieces, then pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. Yes, I'm praying for you. Have you considered this, this, and this? That, that, that. <laughs> that, 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 that. And it doesn't mean, with wisdom, about tribulation, that you're not going to have difficulty. One of the things everybody has to learn, Gavin, when they try to go into the ministry and the missions field and to other countries and all kinds of stuff, is everything you say yes to is no to a million other things. And those million other things can be good things in and of themselves, but they will be an error and a detraction to you if you're trying to do something else. And you have to understand that the moment you make a decision to move forward in anything in life that the Lord's calling you into, everything that can set itself against you doing that is going to do it. 80% of the spiritual warfare every Christian believes is simple faithfulness and very, very small things. That's it. When we can get that, then the biggest thing we deal with is just simple, monotonous, unexciting faithfulness, we will have 80% of our spiritual warfare down beneath our feet in sure victory. We keep looking for projectile vomits and 360 head spins, but really it's just, I don't feel like it today. Secondly, the kingdom of God, this kingdom of our Lord Jesus, is in, not limited to, but in the apostolic succession. What did Jesus tell the twelve in Luke 22? And I assign to you as my Father assigned to me. That word assigned is, is a specific word. It means to ordain, to mark out. It's, it's not just a generalization. He's, it's a very concrete um, term. I assign to me. So in the same way the Father assigned, ordained, gave me the, a kingdom, I give it to you, to the twelve. On thrones, judging the twelve tribes, of Israel. Not 11, but 12. Acts 14. When they had appointed elders, I put in priests there because of the, it's the language. When they appointed elders for them in every church, in every city, is the implication, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And Paul says again to the Colossians, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. The love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit. Epaphras, Paul calls him a fellow minister. You want to guess that word minister, where we get the word minister? 
What's behind it? That one? Just guess. Priest. No, no, no. Deacon. Not ceased to pray for you, delivered us from the domain of darkness, and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. So from what we understand, when Paul gets to Ephesus and he's got multi years of radical, wildfire, awesome, powerful signs and wonders, book burning of witchcraft kind of ministry. While he's there renting the hall of Tyrannus and he's teaching all the time, he's sending out these people throughout what's the Lycus Valley. So here he is in Ephesus and he's sending people through all the surrounding countryside and they're going out and they're preaching and they're doing all the stuff that goes into evangelism. And in many cases, the work that these guys go out and do creates churches. That's how we get the church in Colossians, Colossae, Laodicea, Hierapolis, all through that region of the valley, this big valley, these churches are popping up. And Paul is referring to Epaphras, who was the guy who went to Colossae. And he says he's wrestling, he's agonizing for you in prayer. He's a faithful servant, he's a deacon, he's praying for you. And I've heard about it. And we can't stop giving thanks, Eucharist, for you, for remembering you in our prayers. Notice the connection. If the Lord is here, and he gives the kingdom to the twelve, and then the, the twelve, the kingdom goes out further amongst others, and then it goes out and so it starts to cover the whole world. So that in Colossians chapter 1, Paul talks about the gospel being preached all over the earth. And it's not disconnected from the apostles. I can't remember the Latin phrase. Help me here, Arthur. Is it? It's uh, ubi episcopus. Um, where the church, where the bishop is, there the church is. Where the bishop is, there the church is. It is uh, increasingly unpopular. How much time do I got, Gavin? Do I need to move oh, on to this point? <laughs> <laughs> Come here. <laughs> You're going to be Russian Orthodox. Uh, well, just Orthodox. And your name now is not Ignatius, but Tikhon. T I K O K H O N. Okay? You got a huge beard, man. It's godly. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord's got a beard. They pluck it out. You'll get there. <laughs> 125 years ago, Tikhon was a representative for the Orthodox churches with what was uh, the Episcopal Church, specifically in the United States, and I think in Canada, so the Anglicans in the United States. And here's where it almost happened. Complete intercommunion between the two almost took place. But when they got, they found out more, Tikhon said, you're more interested in being like the new, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, being like the new religious groups that are starting up than the historic church that Christ established. Mm -hmm. right? So they slowed it down a little bit. We sit down. Then World War I happened. Well, nobody's talking to Russia now, not legally. <laughs> World War II happens. And then you get into the 1960s by the time they start to resume dialogue. And when that dialogue begins, the mainline churches in the United States that represented those historic bodies are already starting to encourage false teaching significantly. Mm -hmm. If anybody knows anything about the Orthodox churches, they are more conservative than Rome. They've had fewer changes than Rome. One of their biggest complaints about <clears throat> us is that we make too many changes. Give an example. There's been, I think, three or four times in the entire history of the Orthodox churches where they've revised mm -hmm. their worship service. 400. <laughs> Let me back that up again, because I don't think that clicked. In 2,000 years, there's been four times they've changed what they do for church. And when I say changed, I mean like there were two or three lines made look like in Jerusalem in the year 315. Go check out an Orthodox church. It really hasn't changed. The liturgy of St. James, referring to James, the bishop of Jerusalem, that's what they call it, takes like two and a half hours. Man, I couldn't be in church that long. Read the early church fathers. What was James known for? 
his camel knees because he spent so much time in prayer on the stone. We want to get into church and rush right out and, and chase everything in the world because that's where the excitement is. But the Bible says, oh, that's passing away. Come on. We can't be in God's house to be in God's presence, but we're going to go to heaven forever. What are you going to do? Bowl? <laughs> <laughs> just, that's just a thought. Point three. Let me, well, before I do that, let me, let me conclude that thought about the kingdom and the apostolic succession. It's the sigma and the race thing. When you go to large churches that are historically connected, the historical connection is there. You know, it's easy to look around and see an absence of emotional fervor. Because anybody who does anything for a long time knows that it can become monotonous. And it goes back to something I touched on last week. Is that when we talk about revival in the United States, and it's its own subculture in the church. When we talk about revival, we don't usually, people aren't talking about obedience. They're not talking about coming back to obeying God. They're talking about enthusiasm. They're not the same thing. I know plenty of enthusiasts at the ball game. <laughs> Religious revival means that we're going to obey the Lord. And how do you have a revival but for something that is within the church and you've got an order, order, organization, articulation, and arrangement that people are reviving to? If you have a revival and there's something they're being revived to, well, then it's not really a revival anymore. 2010, I was helping my pastor at the time. Uh, I was holding the ladder while he was painting the carport of the church. And didn't trust me to paint any the figure. And so we were talking about Billy Graham. And I said, well, you know, uh, I was a Christian for a year before, it ever, I ever, before I realized that cohabitation was a sin. You know, people live together before they get married. I didn't know it was a sin because I didn't grow up in the church. And that's been the way people have lived commonly since the late 60s, early 70s. So all the adults that I hung out with were only like 10 to 15 years older than me anyway. The rule is you cohabitate first, decide you like the person, then you get married. And he looked at me and he said, Daryl, brother, I hate to tell you, but that's pagan. I said, I know it is. And my point is, that was 15 years ago. And that was 2010 we had this conversation. He said, that was then. Think about how much it's changed now. I said, Billy Graham, this was then. I said, he could get up and preach in the 60s and 70s, 50s, 40s. Come to Jesus. And the people making the decision had some sort of idea of what that looked like. Hmm. No one has that anymore. So the whole approach to how we share the gospel that's got to come from an orderly place and a fiery place. It's got to be both. So when you're looking at the large historic churches, the form, for the most part, is right. Their articulated doctrines in their books, 96, 98% of it, spot on scriptural. The issue is they don't know what they're doing for the people that are still there, even though the attendance has been falling rapidly for 60 years. Pray for them. Pray the Lord wakes up those embers somehow. I think about that. I must move on. Point three. The kingdom is in the Eucharist. He reclined at the table, again with the twelve, the apostles with him. He took a cup, he took bread, and he says that you may eat and drink with me in my table and my kingdom. When he says, I'm conferring upon you a kingdom, it's so that you can sit with me at my table and eat with me in my kingdom. The kingdom of God. This is the locus right here. What does it look like for the kingdom of God to be center stage in the church and in the world? It's the Eucharist. At the Last Supper, Jesus binds these things together. So that now when we read Paul's letters and we read the book of Acts and they go out doing the signs and the wonders and the miracles and the preaching and the discipling and the encouraging and the strengthening and all the things that they do. Right here. This is where it starts. Send us out to do the work you have given us to do. And then we come back, right, to be before the Lord. And I want to conclude with this elongated story. So that means, give me five more minutes. Or ten. <laughs> Acts 20, Paul is 
once on uh, the first day of the week, gathered with the disciples to break bread, that means Eucharist, Paul talked and talked and talked a lot longer than me. So that Eutychus fell asleep in the window, fell down, and died. And Paul goes down, stretches out across Eutychus like Elijah and Elisha of old, and says he's alive, goes back up, and keeps <laughs> and breaking bread. So we see it looks like they have Eucharist at least twice, maybe, and some meals, and they're just snacking and eating at the same time. What about here? What about what about this story? When you're reading the, the Bible, you've got to remember that in the stories have definite starts and they have definite ends. Like a unit of text. Okay? And those things hang on each other like a chain. And sometimes those links are bigger blocks, and the bigger blocks link to each other. And that's how you get a book. You tracking with me? Mm -hmm. So when you come across any, anything in the New Testament especially, and you've got a block of text of a particular story, there are allusions and references and quotations, and, and, and sometimes they cite the text, but often they don't, of them taking all of this other text back here from the Old Testament, and they're pulling it into these streams, or, uh, threads, and they're, and they're giving you a nice little boom. And they're referring to all the stuff behind it. And they do it in a very concise way. That's happening here in the passage. Because Paul is in the upper room on an accident. And in the upper room, there are many lamps. Is it possible that they are in an upstairs room and that's really bright? Yeah, because Eutychus falls out the window. But is that why Luke's wasting space to give us the detail? No. Because... Luke and Acts, the Gospel and the Book of Acts, are so large that Luke fills up the front and the back of the common-sized ancient scroll. Meaning, the length of the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts are what they are because he couldn't write anything else and keep it in one scroll. So when he takes all of that and condenses it into this one story, what is he saying when they're in an upper room? Remember Pentecost? When he's saying that it's filled with lamps... Yeah, lamps, but lamps. What's that about? All the way back, all through the Old Testament, there's this the phrase, lamp is used, yes, for the lamps in the temple as a picture of the people being ablaze before the Lord. And so Paul isn't just rambling and they're all yawning and falling asleep. The whole point is Eutychus needs to get a little brighter because he couldn't maintain with the lamp, with the fire that Paul's pouring out upon the people as they're breaking bread. This is the kingdom of God. Because also with lamps, especially in the Psalms, is the connection between the lamp for David and his throne. Lamp, throne, upper room. That sounds like the kingdom of God. Because Luke, who's writing this story, wrote that gospel... And in Acts 22, you've been with me. You've been with me suffering. What has Paul been doing? Suffering. He says, I'm going to give you a kingdom, and you're going to sit with me at my table to eat and to drink into my kingdom. And what is Paul doing for those people? See, we can't separate the kingdom of God from the Eucharist. We can't separate the Eucharist from the apostles. We can't separate the kingdom of God from the apostles and the Eucharist and what it means to suffer for the gospel. The power of Christ is that you will endure wrongdoing and you won't slander in response. That means you don't have to get, you can't get angry about it. And the Lord awoke from sleep. Like a warrior overcome with wine. Man, you got to pray that. And if you got to sing, struck them on the park behind ten times. Sing it. But you give it to Jesus. Okay. Let's conclude there this morning. I'll just conclude there. I think I think that is plenty to chew on, to reflect on. Um, <clears throat> a friend of mine doing some missions work 
the boat he was in tipped over. He spent so many hours drifting out in the middle of the sea there with his team. Did a lot of like pioneer missions work. Comes back to the United States. He's got no infrastructure to help him. Works as an assistant manager of Fazoli's. This 10, 15 years ago. And I didn't know he was working there. I pulled to the drive thru and I was like, What are you doing here? Oh man, I need I need a job. I said, My brother, you have sweat and bled and almost drowned for the gospel, and the church isn't helping you? No, it's okay, it's okay. It's not okay as I'm taking my bag of spaghetti or whatever it was I got. <laughs> See, we go chasing after the big name with the lights because that guy can, can lay hands on you and fall down. Don't go looking for that. Look for the guy who sweats and nearly dies and then when he comes home, gets a job as an assistant manager and is faithful and he preaches the gospel and he doesn't back down when he comes into conflict. That's what you got to look for. Look for the stuff that doesn't get promoted. I hate to say it, but most of what gets promoted is because somebody's got dirt on somebody else. When you live long enough, you see it over and over, don't you? doesn't mean that's in every case. But I'm telling you, when you're looking for something that's the kingdom of God, look for something the sun is in a mustard seed. Look for something that's growing in hard soil. Look for something that's bearing fruit, even if it's not flashy, because the more flashy it is, the more it's not in alignment with the crucifixion of Christ. Because while that was very public, it was a very public humiliation. Amen. Amen. Amen.